Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are, and thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, my name is Dr. Peter Lee, and I'm a research fellow here at the Foreign Policy and Defense Program at the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, of Australia. The University of Sydney stands on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. I further acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and future. Hello, dan salamat datang di Akara Kami. Kumusta at mali gayang pag dating sa aming kaganapan. Xin chào và chào mung guisu den coaching toy. Sorry to all of my uh, co authors for absolutely butchering that, um, but I just want to say hello and welcome to our event. Um, it's a great pleasure uh, to be moderating today's session to launch um, our report um, titled Many Hands. Uh, Australia-US Contributions to Southeast Asian Maritime Security Resilience. It's been an absolute pleasure for me uh, to work on this project uh, with four truly distinguished leading experts um, from Southeast Asia. So our report is the latest installment in the Foreign Policy and Defence Program's ongoing work on how the United States, Australia, and other like-minded partners can promote a stable Indo-Pacific order um, and a favourable balance of power. Uh, it complements our 2021 uh, report, Correcting the Course, How the Biden Administration Should Compete for Influence in the Indo-Pacific. It also complements our 2022 report, A Seat at the Table, um, The Role of Regional Multilateral Institutions in the Indo-Pacific Strategy by Susanna Patton, uh, both of which are available on our website. Our project um, is generously supported by the Australian government through a grant from the Department of Defense's Strategic Policy Grants Program. And is also made possible thanks to the ongoing support we receive from our corporate donors, uh, Northrop Grumman and TELUS, for which we are very grateful. Um, as always, the views expressed um, in this webinar um, are those of the speakers alone. So thank you for joining us today. Um, and really it's a great uh, privilege to release this report um, and really, I guess, engage in a robust discussion and hopefully a thought-provoking discussion about what Australia and the United States can and should be doing to better align their efforts um, in Southeast Asia with key partners. Um, really, I think the point today is that no individual country um, can um, deal with and manage uh, China's maritime coercion in the region. And each country is really grappling with this question of how to work collectively. And so we wanted to really understand from Southeast Asian scholars and experts themselves, um, what are the opportunities that exist, what is already happening, uh, what could be rethought and reimagined in terms of how Australia and the US, both individually but also collectively, um, can empower Southeast Asian partners to defend their national interests uh, in the South China Sea. So I'm very delighted um, that all four of our authors could join us today. I know they're all very busy. Um, and so it's a great um, honor, I guess, to, to be in a room together with them. Um, we have um, with us uh, Mr. An Ristian Atriandi Suprianto, um, a lecturer at Universitas Indonesia, um, most also a research fellow at RSS in Singapore. Um, he was also an Indonesian presidential scholar um, during his uh, doctoral studies. We also have Professor Renato Cruz de Castro. Uh, he's the Dr. Aurelia Calderon Chair of Philippine American Relations at De La Salle University. I'm truly one of the veterans um, of this uh, question of maritime security cooperation um, in Southeast Asia. Um, we also have Dr. Colin Coe, um, a research fellow at the Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies at RSIS, really one of the keenest watchers, I think, of, of maritime and naval cooperation in the region. And we also have Dr. Lenan uh, Thien Nguyen, uh, Director General of the EC Institute at the Diplomatic Academy of Vietnam, and for most recently a deputy head of mission um, in London. So um, I don't want to take up too much of the time. Um, we've put the link to the report, which I encourage all of our audience um, watching today um, to check out, um, but we'll then engage in a wide ranging discussion with the authors. And so I guess very briefly, I'll ask each of our authors to in about three or four minutes, um, just outline what they cover in their chapter. Um, 
and really where they see opportunities for Australia and the United States to be working more closely um, with their own countries. Um, so I might start with um, Andy um, from the Indonesian perspective. Thank you, Peter, and uh, thank you for inviting me um, to this project. And um, very happy to contribute. And thanks for your all your effort to um, getting it uh, published. Um, let me know if I go over time, but just to briefly um, describe my uh, my chapter in in the paper. So basically, I started off with um, an assessment of the fundamental shift in Indonesia's strategic landscape or rather strategic seascape. Um, whereas um, for the first time in um, over centuries, Indonesia has seen China emerging as a, a maritime power or rather as a continental power with a significant uh, maritime component. And China brings its own set of um, understanding of uh, sea power and of maritime uh, control, and this has impinged upon Indonesia's uh, own maritime identity, which in Indonesia we call it the Tana Air, the land and water. Uh, specifically, this impinge on how Indonesia defines its uh, archipelagic state, defines its maritime boundaries in the South China Sea. And I think um, in the introduction, I laid out uh, very clearly why uh, China presents Indonesia with the uh, with us, not, not just a legal challenge, but also, uh, I think, fundamentally a strategic challenge. And I think this is where Indonesia's maritime interests and those of America and Australia could uh, converge. And um, I think the starting point is, you know, Indonesia's maritime integrity and indeed Indonesia's concept of an arbitrary state should be in the best interests of America and Australia. And of course, I think uh, we had um, the previous discussion with, you know, we had um, uh, from the audience, I think a commentary, you know, of course, uh, the way Indonesia defines our strategic state may not in conformity with America and Australia, you know, there are some issues we can discuss about that. But I think um, fundamentally, you know, um, there are a broad convergence of interests between Indonesia, Australia and America when seeing how China uh, tries to um, impose its maritime uh, control, especially in the South China Sea. And um, in in the later parts of the of my chapter, I described there are four areas where this uh, convergence of interests could be uh, further developed. The four areas are exercises and patrols, capability transfer industrial and technological collaboration. And finally, education and training. Basically, they are just, uh, these are some of my um, suggestions, uh, recommendations on how Australia and America could help Indonesia becoming uh, more able to respond uh, to the challenges, maritime challenges that China poses. And also, but not, not just um, helping Indonesia to um, improve its resilience, maritime resilience, but also improve its self-reliance in delivering that resilience. So um, in terms of exercises and patrols, for instance, I suggest that there should be more collaboration in trilateral and multi minilateral uh, exercises. Um, the uh, super, super Garda Shield uh, exercise that was uh, you know, recently concluded, and I think uh, there will be another one uh, next year, is quite, um, is quite uh, helpful in trying to bring uh, more, uh, at least, you know, confidence building measures between Australia, Indonesia, and America. Uh, but more importantly, it's also uh, a, a signaling exercise, you know, um, to China that um, Indonesia can also, uh, also has alternative uh, partners, you know, that can help uh, improve its resilience to withstand uh, China's um, maritime coalition. Um, another uh, example was crocodile response, which is a humanitarian exercise uh, that involves not just the military, interestingly, not just the military, military officers from the three countries, Indonesia, Australia, and America, 
but also uh, civilian counterparts you know, in disaster exercises. Of course, uh, its emphasis is on uh, military operation rather than war, but um, this can serve as a useful template, you know, if the three countries sought to um, expand uh, the cooperation, still in the trilateral format, they expand into other scenarios, which can be combat oriented. Second is a uh, capability uh, transfer. I suggested, you know, um, perhaps it's time for uh, Australia to, um, Australia and America uh, help uh, improve Indonesia civilian maritime law enforcement capacity, um, helping Indonesia build more uh, offshore patrol vessels. Um, I think that would be useful. Uh, surveillance, uh, and I think the, um, the Quad recently uh, initiated the Indo-Pacific Maritime Security Initiative that offers commercial, uh, commercially available satellites to monitor illegal fishing practices. So something somewhere along those lines would be very helpful. Um, third uh, initiative is industrial and technological uh, collaboration, um, how America and Australia can improve Indonesia's state of shipbuilding and munitions factory capacity. And finally, uh, education and training, where uh, I emphasize uh, capabilities in cyber and electromagnetic warfare, where Indonesia severely lacks. So basically, um, all this, uh, there are more measures that we could think of uh, in terms of these four streams of convergence. Um, of course, um, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to discuss more. Um, basically, uh, I see that within the five to 15 years ahead, I think the two, the first two um, uh, areas are, uh, have more potential, have greater potential to be realized. Exercises and patrols, as well as uh, capability transfer. Exercises and patrols, you know, um, usually, you know, like the Super Guardia Shield, it was uh, expanded from uh, exclusively army and exclusively bilateral US and Indonesia. And then it became um, tri-surface, you know, involving Air Force and uh, Naval uh, units, as well as uh, becoming multilateralized, you know, from a bilateral, not even a trilateral, but it became a multilateral exercise almost overnight. So of course, you know, there were discussions uh, beforehand, you know, in, there were processes that had been undertaken beforehand to uh, ensure um, the compatibility among the exercise participants. But, you know, um, despite despite the challenges, uh, they, they, were, they proved to be uh, not insurmountable. Um, and uh, we, you know, um, industrial and technological cooperation, as well as well as education and training, might require a time frame beyond uh, fifteen years, just because um, there's be, there needs to be more in infrastructure in place for industrial cooperation. For, for instance, like how to expand and uh, improve Indonesia's shipbuilding capacity. You know, it requires a lot of uh, capital investment. And of course, education and training. Education is not something that we can do overnight. Um, usually, uh, the results can also can only appear after you know, or within twenty years or so. So, um, it it is indeed a long term uh, timeline for for building this uh, kind of partnerships. I'm happy to discuss and take your questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Andy. Uh, Renato, um, if you're there, we might go to you to, to get a sense of also where you see the new administration in Manila um, heading in terms of trilateral cooperation with Australia and the US. Okay, uh, good afternoon. So I will not discuss the entire paper, but basically raise some key points uh, regarding you know what I already presented, uh, delivered. Uh, number one, of course, is the fact that you have a clear-cut security partnership. It's highly institutionalized. When you talk about the Philippines, Australia, and the United States. Just last week, we had a conference on the trilateral Philippine-Japan-US relation. And somebody asked a question, is there something more institutionalized than this? I said, this is the case with Philippines, Australia, and the United States. It's relatively you know, more in, uh, institu institutionalized than what we had with Japan for a number of reasons. Number one, historically, uh, 
uh, you know, the uh, ANSUS and the mutual defense treaty were actually linked if you go back to the 1950s. And of course, there's been history of uh, security relations between Australia and the Philippines. During the Cold War, you have the Australians training in Clark Air Base and a number of military exercises. But of course, aside from the United States, we only have one status of forces agreement and that is of course with Australia. And this very close security relationship, of course, became very apparent in 2017 uh, during the siege of Marawi, when after, of course, the United States indo pacom Command sent its uh, P-8 Poseidons, the following day, of course, you have P-3 from the Royal Australian Navy providing direct assistance to the armed force of the Philippines who were, of course, conducting street-to-street uh, -street battles in, the bat uh, bat uh, in Marawi and it's very convenient for Australia to provide assistance to the Philippines, primarily because we have a status of forces agreement. But nevertheless, you have some views, uh, especially among the Australians, that Philippine-Australia security partnership is always overshadowed by the Philippine-US alliance. And that has been the case. It is slow development. For example, the status of forces agreement between the Philippines and Australia was originally signed in 2007, but was only concurred to and ratified by the Philippine Senate in 2000, uh, I think 2012 or 2013. So, and of course the level of development. Interestingly, you have of course the dramatic improvement in Philippine-Australian relation during the time of President Rodrigo Duterte. When President Rodrigo Duterte tried to distance the Philippines away from the United States, this was seen as something very alarming in Canberra and also in Tokyo. So you have actually Japan and Australia extending their hand to Manila during time of the Duterte administration. And at the time, President Duterte simply does not have, want to have anything to do with the United States. So he also in a way accommodated the increasing security cooperation that was of course extended by Tokyo and Can Canberra. And I'll focus on Canberra. I was pleasantly surprised when I noticed we signed a number of agreements and you have the dramatic increase of course of Philippine Australian security cooperation, army, air, uh, you know, army training with you know, Filipino counterpart and of course the Navy. Uh, and of course, uh, recently you have again this dramatic improvement in Philippine US security relation at the tail end of the Duterte administration. So again, this creates of however concern that Philippine Australia security partnership might be overshadowed again by Philippine US alliance. But I don't think that would be the case, uh, especially of course, if Australia and the United States would of course cooperate in, uh, I use the term tipping the balance uh, and ensuring that the Philippines maintain a healthy relation with its traditional security ally and that's the United States and security partners. And having, of course, second thoughts to the policy adopted by the Duterte administration. That is, of course, an appeasement policy vis-a-vis -vis China. And of course, you have another opportunity that's been created by the fact that under the Duterte administration, despite its effort to appease China, has actually improved the territorial defense capabilities of the armed force of the Philippines. And this, of course, raises the need for the armed force of the Philippines to conduct uh, training, not just with any other state, but this is something that has been emphasized in the armed forces of the Philippines. You know, I've been conducting consultancy in the National Defense College and in the military with like-minded partners, referring primarily, of course, to Japan and Australia. So again, I see a, you know, a very uh, positive trend right now. The fact that the United States and Australia and other US allies are here to basically ensure uh, that the Philippines would have second thoughts about continuing the appeasement policy of the previous administration. So I gave my recommendations there, the fact that uh, any efforts to improve the Philippine military capability, also in terms of the software education would have to be done in, in terms of tandem, you know, US, Australia, Australia, Japan, always of course engaging the Philippines. Uh, the key challenge of course is uh, number one, uh, installing, of course, a sense of political will on the part of the Philippine government to continue a policy of moving away from appeasement towards what I call a limited balancing policy vis-a-vis -vis China. 
And this will, of course, involve uh, developing, strengthening the territorial defense capability of the armed forces of the Philippines. So I gave my recommendations there. I think I end my recommendation there with uh, probably a, uh, a change in the a certain mindset among Australian defense officials that we have to look at you know, the Philippine-Australian security partnership in a broader context of linking the spokes together. That uh, right now, especially right now, that uh, we have a lot of challenging developments that are happening in the region. So that's, I basically would end my, my short discussion there. I'm looking forward to more interesting discussion like later during the Q&A. Thanks so much, Renata. Uh, Colin, we'll go to you. Um, hi, uh, everyone. Thanks so much. Uh, allow me to thank the USSC for allowing me to contribute to this very interesting report. Uh, special thanks to Peter for having me and being so patient with me as I contribute <laughs> my perspectives uh, with the ongoing you know, correspondences here and there. And of course, uh, my uh, you know, deep appreciation to the reviewers who you know, gave very good uh, constructive feedback for the paper itself. Now, uh, I, I will go very short uh, because I believe you will read uh, the report on your own. But basically, I just want to raise a few important points. I think one is to first lay out the report on Singapore's perspectives on maritime security cooperation and how Singapore views gray zone challenges of maritime coercion at large as being holistic and that goes beyond kinetic actions and kinetic solutions as well. This point is something that I, I explored uh, near to the end of that chapter itself. But in a large part, we are looking, I'm looking at how best Singapore can remain relevant in contributing to regional and world rules-based order especially in the maritime arena and how Singapore can contribute to not only national, but also regional resilience. So in that light, this is where I segue the discussion on uh, its cooperation with uh, Australia and the US uh, altogether. I think it is first to highlight that Singapore already enjoys longstanding security partnerships with both Australia and the US. I mean, these you know, security partnerships date decades and they are not considered low base as of now compared to you know, equivalent uh, partnerships that our neighbors may have, for instance. And so in that regard, Singapore has already cultivated very carefully a set of defense and security initiatives with both countries, including joint military training, including in high-end conventional war fighting, um, as well as in military technology. So when I craft this chapter and try to look at how best and what more Singapore can do, you know, I, I sort of try to scratch my head a little and try to think out the box and try to think of more innovative, you know, ideas to pursue uh, in trying to expand that cooperation. And with the question of asking how Singapore can remain relevant and expanding these to fruitful and constructive partnerships with the eye on ultimately and generally contributing to regional order, and especially in the maritime domain. So in that regard, I think I saw three main um, prompts of how Singapore could go about enhancing these partnerships. One is to facilitate continued military presence by Australia and the US, but note that it is not solely exclusive to Australia and the US. In fact, Singapore has been trying to facilitate you know, this sort of presence from interested, like-minded stakeholders who are interested in maintaining regional security. So that could come from the region and that also come from outside the region, including those in Europe, for instance. A good example would be uh, in a recent study I've undertaken, I sort of tabulated last year, uh, how many uh, you know, engagements that Singapore has done with the European uh, powers. Because if you recall last year, there has been an unprecedented spate in you know, these sort of uh, neighbor presence from Europe in the region. And Singapore, in fact, you know, has been actively promoting such engagements like you know, allowing port visits, as well as you know, providing uh, you know, opportunities for joint exercises. So I think going forward, this is something that Singapore will continue to pursue. And it's something that you know, I believe isn't the only uh, thing that Singapore will you know, uh, go about doing in building this regional resilience. I think one, the other prong that I would like 
to talk about is contributions to existing or future unilateral initiatives. For example, under the Quad, there is the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain Awareness, and Singapore has a ready solution to that is, is that the Information Fusion Center that is based in Changi Naval Base uh, would be you know, one of the keynotes uh, for the IPMDA going forward based on you know, what I know so far uh, uh, as such. So, and Singapore, of course, isn't alone. Uh, IFC is likely going to work alongside the other equivalent information, information fusion center across the region as well uh, in contributing towards that regional MDA. So that is the second part. And the last part, which is something that might have gone beyond what we deem of as maritime security cooperation, because I try to you know, look at maritime security cooperation in a more holistic sense and looking at not just kinetic challenges, but how broadly we could build regional economic resilience against coercion. And taking into account that economic coercion is one of the tools that work alongside maritime coercion, it is often not easy to you know, dissociate both of them at once. So therefore, I think in, in this sense, what Singapore is doing is to also try to promote these sort of partnerships with Australia and the US. For example, in 2019, Singapore has actually, you know, signed on to an agreement with the US to promote, you know, sustainable financing uh, in infrastructure development uh, for third parties. I think this is something you know that appears at least in my point of view in, in response to the discussion about potential debt traps that could be presented by certain initiatives uh, in the region which uh, we can talk more about later so i think it, on the whole I, I try to put forth a more holistic set of uh, a sort of recommendations uh, they are not all necessarily dealing with maritime security but i will challenge our readers to try to look at these sort of maritime gray zone challenges in a more holistic sense. And maybe from there, it is you know, much more easy to understand where you know, Singapore comes from. So with that, I end my short brief. I look forward to the discussion later. Thanks, Peter. Thanks so much, Cohen. And finally, Lenan. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Uh, first of all, um, hello, everyone um, tuning online with us today. And thank you so much for the United States Study Center, especially Peter. I just echo Colleen and say thank you for having us to have this report today. So in order to um, um, contribute a piece in the report, um, I answered two questions, is which is why and how uh, we need to strengthen the cooperation in maritime security between Vietnam and the United States, as well as Australia. And um, I try to answer, try to unfold the first question by answering the reason why, by looking at the context at both regional and international level. At regional level, we um, see the application of gray zone tactic in the South China Sea. Um, the presence of naval, the increasing of the um, Chinese sea and air exercise along with the proliferation restriction on maritime traffic, aviation, and um, the continuities of um, violating the legal right of the leisure state in their own EEZ and continental shelf. So all of that um, happened at the threshold that under real serious conflict or tension. So therefore, psychology, people may think that the South China Sea being calm recently, but actually the gray zone tactics still make it under current tension and very much worry, create worry for country in the regions. And at international context, um, we see um, the continuity of arbitrarily interpreting international law. And um, that way of interpreting international law infringe upon sovereignty and territorial integrity of other country. And um, Vietnam, just like other country, worry that um, what happened in Europe today may happen in Asia tomorrow. And the South China Sea may be once again be target of illegal use of what? Um, so therefore, based on the regional and international context, um, we believe that maritime cooperation um, is very much 
um, at a very um, important um, jungle to help the country in the region to um, improve their capacity for self-defense, as well as to expand international cooperation to maintain and protect the rules by order in the South China Sea. So given that um, context, I'm going to um, stop taking the best practice of the current maritime security cooperation between Vietnam, the United States and Australia in order to answer the second question, how we will better um, or, and more effective cooperate in maritime security in, in the coming times. I realized that um, in the past few years, three main areas has been um, promoted in maritime cooperation security uh, between in, in maritime security cooperation between um, the three countries. Um, the first one is port visit. Port visit is not just show up the measures of the military, um, the naval in the region, but actually the port visit is a chance to promote cooperation between naval it also helped to build trust. It also promote cultural exchange and facilitate both people and people and um, high level contacts. The second way of um, maritime cooperation happened, which is capacity building. Um, in the case of Vietnam, there are two formal capacity building has happened. Um, the first one is the hardware, which is um, where Vietnam Coast Guard have very um, helpful in uh, very received very helpful assistance from the US Coast Guard in providing some cutters, uh, patrol boats and uh, vessels. Um, on the second aspect of capacity building, which is a software, um, we received um, the skill and language training from both Australia and, and the US. And the third area for um, cooperation, which is maritime domain awareness, where we already build contact, we um, cooperate in sharing information. Um, that was very important, and we are looking forward for the prospecting of IPMDA, which Andy already mentioned. So based on that three areas that has been very successful cooperated among countries, um, we believe that those are areas we should build up. We should not stop and we should continue. But in addition to that three main areas, I also try to like um, um uh, like my previous speaker, I also try to think um, out of the box to see what else we can do, what else we can recommend for like better cooperation. Um, so, of course, um, a cooperation in, in the field to address all the gray zone tactic is very important. But I also think about um, the other area that contribute to uh, the prosperity of the region, more sustainable and long-term development, which is um, cooperation in marine environment protection, conservations, um, cooperation in marine scientific research, um, transferring the ocean management technologies, as well as marine economic toward green and sustainable development. So that is the first area I think we should add on of what had been done. The second um, uh, area that I think which is also important is in 2016, we have the very important award um, on the South China Sea, which um, highlights some interpretation of um, international law as well as UNCLOS in relevant context of the South China Sea that help us narrow down the overlapping maritime zones and help us based on that to develop um, the uh, cooperation model. Uh, I believe that we should join efforts to highlight the um, important award um, and applied it um, in clarifying our claims as well as uh, form the area for cooperation. And the third one, which is very important, um, actually we um, adherent uh, from the previous um, um, comments of the speakers um, and uh, participants, which is um, as this um, webinar, we have Andy, we have um, Renato, we also have Colin, all talk about the need of cooperation. So why do um, 
why don't we think about the expanded into minilateral borders? So it's not just bi bilateral, but multilateral or minilateral cooperation with country with similar cooperation needed. Um, we also can expand to some other country with similar interests like Japan, India, and perhaps China, if they are willing to join us in maintaining a good order at sea in the South China Sea. And I totally with Andy a suggestion before and also Colin that Joint patrol is a very important area for the regions in order to maintain good order at sea. I also think that tabletop exercise and going to field exercise on simulations that arise from the rapid changes um, of, this, of the situation on, on, on the maritime domain, um, especially given that um, we are heavily impact of um, climate change, we heavily impact of new technologies, um, all of that will cause a different maritime domain and it needs different response and coordinations. So with that, I think um, whatever we do, we try to join effort to bring a better South China Sea and maritime security cooperation to the regions. Um, it doesn't mean that we we are trying to do a lie or build up a collusion against anyone. Um, for Vietnam, the three no policy, um, no joining military alliance, no association with one country to oppose to another, no using force to or threaten use of force, um, no permitting foreign country to set up military base still, still there. And the, the force and fort mode Wishes of Vietnam is to maintain a peaceful and stable environment, including um, preserving amicable relations with China and neighboring ASEAN country um, in order to focus on economic development and protect all our legitimate interests at sea and at land. So with that, I, I stop here and I'm looking forward for the Q&A section. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lanan. Um, I hope those very brief presentations um, interest our audience to go read the full report. Um, it's not too long, um, but it, I think it also reflects the incredible diversity um, of Southeast Asian partners, um, of what Australia and the United States um, can view as possible or, or achievable um, in their cooperation with each of these countries. They all have, have incredibly diverse relations with Australia and the US, but also with China. And so I think that sort of sense of there is no one size fits all um, is very much um, an important consideration. Uh, um, at the end of that report, um, in the conclusion, I essentially, I try to distill, um, I guess, what are the common themes across the four case studies that we looked at? And I think many of the uh, recommendations are very specific to individual countries. So for instance, Colin's discussions about economic resilience um, might sort of play less well um, for other cases. Um, so I tried to distill to four pathways that Australian and US officials can really keep in mind. And it was essentially first of uh, rapid shipbuilding, basically how we can move towards a more collective shipbuilding enterprise that also brings in the, the financing and, and manufacturing capabilities of other US extra regional partners like Japan and Korea, but also Singaporean financing. The second one was really to hopefully provoke uh, discussion about rethinking how we provide um, lethal and long-range um, guided munitions capabilities, basically strike capabilities. And this is an area that comes out of, I think, Andy's chapter, the idea that actually many of these partners um, are still at the very starting stages of building their uh, long-range strike uh, capabilities and arsenals. The third area is really where Shen, the US, um, take a step back, I guess, in terms of the, the direct interaction with uh, China's activities in the South China Sea um, by really providing surveillance um, and information sharing um, to then enable countries and partners to pursue and respond as they see fit. Um, the last one, which comes out of sort of Renato's chapter um, and, is, and is very much at the peak of interest right now, is the idea of access and presence um, and how Australians and the United States can rethink um, old ways of using uh, facilities, joint facilities um, in the region with their treaty partners and key strategic partners. Uh, I don't end up with a single recommendation of what they can or should be doing. I don't think there is one, um, but hopefully we set out sort of a range of options for consideration. We have about 20 minutes left. Um, I did have a few questions, but I encourage our audience to put through your questions through the Q&A chat. Um, you've been very patient with us uh, for the last 30 minutes or so. 
So, and we'll endeavor to get through as many of your questions as we can for what I hope will be a lively discussion. Um, but I guess for me, um, there were two questions that really sort of stayed in my mind throughout the course of this one year project. Um, and I'm still not sure if we have a simple answer to them, but I wanted to get our contributors to get their sort of final um, comments on them. So the first one, I guess, for everybody is um, this idea of distraction, this idea that there are times when the US and Australia get distracted by other crises and other issues, and they lose the momentum of what they should be doing in the South China Sea with these Southeast Asian partners. And if you think back to the pivot to Asia, the US got distracted by years of conflict in the Middle East. If you think about today, a lot of the rhetoric about Southeast Asian importance, and yet the conflict in Ukraine or possible you know, crises over Taiwan seem to be, again, you know, causing distraction. And so I wonder, you know, how does how is that seen in Southeast Asia, US and Australian commitments? Um, do you see a risk of distraction again? Um, being a quiet period in the South China Sea is actually kind of a bad thing, I sometimes think, because uh, it means there's not that level of urgency. Um, so I guess, yeah, anybody have any thoughts about this idea? Renata, I see you nodding your head vigorously, so I might kick off with you and then go to Andy. Well, especially when we're dealing with the United States and to a certain degree, Australia, that's a given. Uh, the United States is a global power, and of course, Australia has a tendency to be the deputy sheriff of the United States. So uh, we saw this in the Middle East. Uh, we're seeing this again in the, you know, what's happening in Ukraine. Australia is sending military assistance to Ukraine. And uh, I don't know actually whether this will be a distraction or what. And this is uh, what we have been discussing here because we're the closest country to Taiwan. Whether a major armed contingency in Taiwan will be a distraction from the South China Sea or whether actually they're linked. So uh, in the case of the Philippines, you know, we're trying to think in terms that uh, uh, because we experienced it recently during uh, Speaker Pelosi's visit. Suddenly, the Philippines was included in the, the discourse, whether uh, Speaker Pelosi would land in Luzon or not. So, you know, this is something that we are now taking into account. So uh, when it comes to, let's say, Taiwan, then we will see basically a convergence because, there, you know, the Taiwan Straits is still part of the South China Sea, although but a different dimension. So this is basically my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I would uh, say uh, I would not in agreement with uh, Professor uh, Renato uh, in that that distractions have been um, the norm <laughs> in terms of American and Australian uh, attention to Southeast Asia. And I think um, the question, the more pertinent question is how do we um, sustain uh, cooperation and partnership amidst the um, the, the amid uh, attention that is constantly in flux. So um, I think uh, the momentum uh, at the moment is basically is about um, China's challenge to rules based order, and not just China, by the way. It's also Russia, you know, that is um, quite blatant in uh in the war in ukraine and there are concerns that um american and or even australia you know australia is uh comes from um resides in the pacific but you know it's um it's an ally of the us and whatever is going on in europe australia is has a vested interest to sustain um american presence in europe as well and nato a resolve against Russia. And so, you know, there is there is this division between Europe first or Asia first, right? Um, amid the current situation. And I think uh, that's the um, a misle misleading way of seeing it because um, tackling challenges to rules-based order in Europe um, is basically the same fight as tackling rules-based challenge in Asia. And I think um, Professor Renato has uh, uh, stated clearly that even during the Ukraine war, 
tensions in the Western Pacific, you know, in Taiwan Strait, um, continue unabated, you know, with uh, recent escalation in Taiwan with over Nancy Pelosi visit. So I don't think there is a there is a lack in interest, much less in engagement on um, you know on the part of Western partners to um, to disengage, to downgrade their commitments to Western Pacific to Western Pacific at the moment, precisely because precisely because um, China um, is not going uh, to downgrade its um, the um, the momentum of its challenge uh, anyway. So um, they all uh, come in parallel. What I'm um, concerned though is um, what if there is a vertical escalation in either theaters, whether, you know, um, I think you know, at this moment we are talking about Europe, what if there is a, a nuclear escalation in Ukraine front line? Would that significantly shift um, Western attention uh, to Europe? At the expense of uh, Western Pacific, and you know, to an extent, and um, in terms of resources, could uh, the Western powers sustain the kind of uh, uh, commitments they have poured um, into this region? You know, um, and not just Australia and America. I mean, European countries, you know, uh, members, NATO members have also uh, uh, contributed. To challenging uh, China's uh, maritime caution in the region and trying to defend freedom of, of navigation in the Western Pacific, and most recently, I think even Canada, you know, a NATO partner, is you know uh, has stated that it will uh, continue um, uh, preserving freedom of navigation through the Taiwan Strait. So I think you know, um, um, I, I I don't see it as as uh, as two separate fronts i see it as a single front um because you know uh, china and russia you know in of course there are differences uh, divergences among the two but i think um as far as america and australia are concerned i think they are both challenges to rule space global order and um um you cannot defeat uh one challenge um by um, ignoring the other. So um, it, I think as far as uh, Southeast Asians are concerned, the interests and the engagement will remain there. Um, there will be tactical changes, of course, there will be tactical changes um, on the surface, but I think the, the commitments are there. Yeah. Colin or Lanan, um, any thoughts? Colin? Uh, hi, Gita. <clears throat> yeah, uh, I, I thought this is a very thoughtful question, but uh, I will be slightly optimistic about this on the basis that at the very least, there is a structural constant that we might be faced with going forward is that there's a bipartisan consensus in the US about long-term China challenge. So notwithstanding how you want to call that a distraction because of Ukraine, I think ultimately the long-term focus is on China, right? So, you know, much of the you know attention will increasingly shift towards China as it continues to pose that challenge. And, you know, I think the question about distraction isn't so much about distraction per se, but I will call that a, a, more of a transaction, right? Because if you recall back in the earlier uh, first year of the Trump administration, there were some concerns that Trump administration back then would trade off the South China Sea in exchange for China's cooperation on North Korea. It didn't come to pass, but the concern is always that and be that as it may, I think there are two main broader issues that we are confronted with. One is that generally, I think the U.S. is more interested in engaging its you know, close allies uh, and partners, such as you know, working within AUKUS or working within the Quad or you know, through the traditional uh, alliance system. right? And Southeast Asia will have to find a way to remain relevant in this engagement which goes back to my fellow panelists' uh, thoughts about how best to engage uh, with the US and Australia, right? For Australia, I'm not, I'm not that concerned uh, about whether Australia will be distracted because ultimately Australia is a resident in the neighborhood. And even if there's, there's a distraction, it might be you know, in the immediate neighborhood that is the South Pacific, right? 
and that contributes you know, the sort of feedback to China again. So I'm not so worried about that. The other thing that I think we should be concerned about is whether these sort of engagements, going back to my paper, is, is it too military-centric in nature, right? Will, will this sort of engagement be more fruitful if we expand the remit to talk about, say, you know, econo further economic engagement? I know it is possibly really impossible to talk about free trade or, you know, open market access in the U.S. right now. But, and of course, uh, discarding the whole talk about the U.S. returning to TPP, for instance, and how best can we, you know, sustain engagement via existing economic engagement activities such as IPEF? For example, and how best to further, you know, expand, uh, you know, the interests of Southeast Asian countries in that. I think that is something we need to confront going forward. Thank you. Lana, any thoughts or shall we go to the next? Yeah, I think it is my turn. My answer is yes and no. It's going to be um, no because... Um, if you look at the way it takes for the delay of the launching of the IPS and all the other um, important documents uh, to the um, strategic policy of the U.S. to the region, you can see that, of course, there are some hiccup when the U.S. need to look at the new development and think what to do. But no, because um, nowadays, um, no region um, exists in isolation, um, be it. Atlantic or Indo-Pacific, it all related. We all living in a world that um, where everything depends on each other. And after a, a certain hiccup, I think I agree with Colin that um, all the important documents that the United States government um, launching this year all indicates the priority given to the region. And the important is to um, not only look at the uh, security pillar, but also look at the economic pillar, how to build prosperity for the region and how to make use of technology to, um, and science technology. So, so it's, it is a very positive signal. But in the meantime, it's also raised um, a questions um, on among all the changing of the world, uh, it seems like ASEAN still stay in its own place. Whether it is still like up to date, whether there is a new way to make a connection between ASEAN and some other very fractional and effective minilateral cooperation like what AUKUS should help the region be more effective in cooperation. And also I agree with um, Colleen and other speaker when talking about Australia. I think Australia and ASEAN country have a very close interest with each other. Um, we, to a certain extent, we believe that Australia can, can just can be considered as in the same region with ASEAN countries. So, then no, no hiccup or no like um, delay or distraction from what happened in Europe um, with um, policy and the promotion of cooperation of Australia with the region. Thank you so much, Lara. We only have four minutes left. Um, we did have a few pre-submitted questions, but I've just checked and I don't think any of the questionnaires uh, are in the audience. So for um, everyone if, who if is I'm very a... Go sorry, Andy, if sorry. I may, yeah, sorry. Um, if I may add just one, um, perhaps, um, just to give more nuance to Southeast Asian views is that, um, more commitments from the West. Um, I I already said you know that um there is, you know um that, that it's unlikely that Western commitments going to wane, um towards the Western Pacific. But at the same time, from the Southeast Asian views, there's there are more. I, at least the reception to Western commitments in Western Pacific, they can be quite mixed because um, whatever going to happen in the Taiwan Strait or um, conflict in the Korean Peninsula could um, also um, spill over into Southeast Asian uh, areas as well. And that's what um, South Asian are, are concerned about. And indeed, um, that's why, that's part of the reason ASEAN um, promoted the outlook on the Indo-Pacific so that whatever, you know, the external great powers that play a part, you know, that um, um, maintain presence 
and influence in Southeast Asia um, and in the Indo-Pacific at large will do so not at the expense of Southeast Asian interests, you know, not to side with any of the other powers. And I think uh, recently uh, Indonesia as the new ASEAN chair has also proposed the ASEAN Maritan outlook. So that's uh, another uh, development uh, that uh, we, we should um, uh, follow because that would be interesting how Indonesia would conceive the presence of many uh, external maritime great powers um, in the Indo-Pacific. Yeah, not just China, but also um, the Western powers. Thanks, Andy. <clears throat> we are actually almost out of time now, but I did want to give our audience who are here with us a chance to ask a question. Um, <clears throat> do we have any questions from the audience um, in the sort of minute or two that we have left? If they're directed to any of our authors, um, I do encourage you to ask them now. Okay, in that case, I get to use my privilege to ask the question that I was burning to ask, but you only get about 20 seconds each to reply to this one, okay? Um, this actually comes from the project itself, and in many of the meetings that I did with officials and experts and commentators was this question of strategic alignment. Uh, mm. And Andy made a good point about it in his opening remarks today, that there is an alignment of strategic interests but is that the same as strategic alignment? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess my question to you is, um, is there anything that Australia and the US can do to shift the strategic alignment of your countries as opposed to the alignment of interests? Um, Andy, 20 seconds before you wrap up. <laughs> um, define strategic alignment. If it's uh, formal military alliances, no. If it's a uh, hierarchy of partners Indonesia would prefer to work with, then yes. I think uh, Super Garuda Shield was a clear manifestation of that. So there is a preference, definitely. And um, as I said, uh, the extent and the, the breadth and depth of that partnership depends on how many interests Indonesia converge or share with that partner. The more interests Indonesia share, the deeper, uh, the broader the engagement, the partnership will be. The less, you know, of course, there won't be any alignment as such. So, um, again, strategic alignment is not strategic alliance. Um, alignment of interest means um, there is be more cooperation together, not just more, but also um, bolder cooperation um, in areas where previously uh, they were deemed or might be deemed as controversial. That was actually 20 seconds, Andy. Perfect. Renato, final thoughts? Uh, yes, in the case of the Philippines, there was indeed, uh, in the early part of the Duterte administration, there was, of course, a conscious effort to shift towards, of course, China, and which, of course, he announced openly in 2016. Fortunately, of course, that shift did not happen. In a way, uh, eventually, the, the Philippines and the Duterte administration slowly gravitated back to what we considered, you know, our alliance and, of course, our identification with what we call a, li a like-minded state. The challenge right now is to ensure that it remains that way. That's, of course, our, the role of the United States and its other security allies in Japan, South Korea, and, of course, Australia. Colin, yeah, final words? Uh, yeah, uh, 20 seconds. So uh, I'll echo what my fellow panelists have said, you know, strategic alignment. And you know, one thing to remind everybody is it shouldn't be seen in binary terms, meaning that you know, there will be alignment in areas where you know, it's possible to see interests converge. And I think in this sense, in the area of defense and security, there's much uh, th things in common for that alignment to take place. But in others, I think there'll have to be more space for you know, regional countries to explore. Yeah, thank you. Bailan, you get the last word. Well, um, it's not really um, alignment because everyone will follow the, their own interests and the rules-based order. So as long as if the purpose of like the cooperation is always build up the common like rule-based order, good order at sea and prosperity, then I think 
um, you don't need to ask for us to shift our strategic interest. We won't automatically come forward and ally with anyone would have the common interest. Perfect way to wrap up the webinar, I think. Um, before we go, I do want to thank everybody um, for your time, um, especially our four authors for so much of your time over many months. Um, all of my pestering emails and our webinars and workshops to get this project done. Um, I'm truly grateful and it's been a real interesting learning experience for me to understand the strategic thinking in your own countries. Um, I would like to encourage our audience to sign up to our USSC mailing list. We have a huge range of activities and exciting um, works coming into the pipeline next year. Um, I thank you again for joining us today. Um, the recording will be posted to YouTube and to our website and you can download the report for free at our website. So thank you so much again, um, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, everyone. Hope the thank next you, everyone. activity will be in safety. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thanks.